Before getting on with the show, a point of clarification. I'll be talking a lot about I2C. The official name is I squared C, but I'll almost always say I2C because most people typing the name are still using ASCII and making a superscript to in ASCII is hard. And I usually see it written as I2C, so it's now baked into my mind as I2C. However, Plan 9 doesn't really have this problem because the folks at Bell Labs came up with a better character encoding system around the time they were making Plan 9. They invented UTF-8. Uh, there's a file under lib called keyboard, and it has a bunch of other characters you can use. And you can use them anywhere. You can use them in C files or directory names. All the standard libraries and all the operating system speaks UTF-8. So if you want a superscript 2, you press Alt, S, and 2. And that's not holding down Alt like a shift key. You press it and then release it before hitting the S. Alt, colon, close parent makes a smiley face. Um, Alt, 1, 2 makes a half sign. And alt asterisk and capital D makes a capital delta, um, which I actually use fairly often in code for variables that are holding the change in some value. But anyway, I'm saying I2C because I'm old enough to be set in my ways, and the viewers get a quick lesson in using UTF 8 and Plan 9. And now on to the main attraction. I said I hacked the 9 front kernel to add access to the I2C on the Raspberry Pi, and now I'll show you how I did it. The kernel code is located in System Source 9, and here you'll find several folders. Most of them are for specific architectures. Some of them, like uh, port and IP, are for uh, stuff that all the architectures share. Uh, the ones used for the Pi are BCM and BCM64, BCM being short for Broadcom, which is the company that made the uh, ARM CPUs that are used on the Raspberry Pi. And in my case, I want to use uh, Broadcom64, since I'm using the Raspberry Pi 3Bs and 3B pluses. Uh, now, this is where I'll run the command to build the kernel but it does pull in code from other directories. It grabs stuff from IP and port and also pulls in code from the 32-bit Broadcom uh, kernel directory. So I kind of cheated when it came to adding I2C to 9Front. It was already available on a legacy 9 port done by Richard Miller. So I went to compare Miller's kernel code to 9Front's. Uh, Miller had gone to the trouble of adding a lot of other functionality, but at the time I was just interested in the I2C. Uh, Plan 9 code tends to be very well written and pretty concise, uh, much of it written by legendary systems programmers, and Richard Miller is uh, one of them. He was one of the first people to port Unix, and his current project is working on uh, writing a RISC-V compiler for Plan 9. Uh, anyway, after taking a couple of days to read much of the kernel, I found that I could get the I2 fun I2C functionality by adding the i2c.c and dev i2c.c files uh, straight from Miller's code, adding a few lines to fns.h and dat.h. And then I had to add a i2c entry to a configuration file used by 9Front to tell it to add i2c as a device. So I'm at my 9Front terminal running on an old Dell, and I'm logged in as Glenda, who's the host owner of the file system, because I'll be messing around with the system files. Uh, I've already added the two files from Miller's code here in the Broadcom directory. So there's i2c and the dev i2c file. And then, in, since I'm going to be compiling the 64-bit kernel, I also made modifications to the header files here. And here's the little bit I added to the fns.h file. And 
Yeah, these are used to actually talk, little functions to actually talk to the ITC device. And then in dat.h added this little struct here, which is used for um, constructing stuff for the ITC device too, handling the addresses and stuff. And then later used to um, actually set up the file system for it so you can access it like files. And then in this little configuration file under dev, I added an entry for ITC. And now I just need to compile it. And if you ever sat through compiling a Linux kernel, I'm sure you are now amazed. Right, up here we can see that it did go and grab the ITC file and compile it. And when it was all done, it copied it to the ARM64 directory. So it's now sitting over there and I should probably clean up the mess. Oh, that looks good. Now I have a new Raspberry Pi kernel sitting on the file server, so it's time to get it onto the Pi. In a previous video, I had a Pi set up on my network here as a CPU server owned by the regular user. So I'll log into it. All right, now keep in mind uh, that we're dealing with namespaces here. This isn't the old convention of a teletype wired right into some self-contained system. This window is a mashup of files off the file server, the keyboard, mouse, and screen of a Dell terminal, and the CPU and RAM of the Raspberry Pi. So to be sure I'm accessing the storage on the Pi, I'll bind it in front of any other storage listed in dev. And now I'll just use the regular command to mount the boot partition. And instead of uh, nine fat for the pi, it's pi dos on nine front. And now off to slash n to see what's there. So I already did a thing showing my hacked kernel, but that was copied from my other nine front system and it was compiled from an old version of 9Front. So this is built from the current uh, community versus infrastructure release. Now to copy the one off the file server, that was ARM64. And now I just got to try it out. And this will tell the Pi to reboot. All right, should have rebooted by now. So I recently went through my attempts at accessing the Sensat sensors uh, and cleaned them up and went over some of the data sheet to fine tune the settings. So let's try some of them out. This will be the temperature and pressure sensor. 
and the temperature and humidity sensor. Yeah, not too bad. Pretty close this time. And uh, since this is a CPU server, um, it doesn't have any monitor or keyboard plugs hanging off it. I can test out the 9-axis uh, sensor on it. So let's try the magnetometer. So I can pick it up and move it around and see the numbers change now. It's looking for magnetic north. And try the accelerometer. Rotate it around. That's pretty cool. And the gyro. And set it back down and it stays stable. So these last three were a little tricky. Uh, if you don't cleanly exit accessing the I2C device, it can lock up the whole I2C interface. And I had to look up how to handle uh, interrupts on plan nine so I could properly close the connection when the delete key was pressed. Uh, I've also written some stuff to use the LED array, but it's sort of a pain dealing with how they decided to uh, input RGB values. Um, if you do have a sense hat and you just want to turn the array off, because usually when it powers up, it has this default rainbow on it. Um, you can manually mount the I2C device and the LED array is at I I2C address uh, 46. And uh, when you mount an I2C device, you'll get a control and a data file for it. And you can just uh, cat a bunch of zeros right into that. So zero. And when it's done, it gives you an error but it does turn off the lights. Um, it's sloppy, but it works. And I hope that was informative. I recently got some new parts, some CO2 sensors, a GPS unit to act as a real-time clock, a four port Intel NIC, uh, but I still have to finish cleaning up a space in my house to get all my computer stuff out of storage and have a proper lab set up. So stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, have fun.